Psalms chapter number 40, you can stand if you'd like to. You do realize that the Antichrist is anti-Semitic. Did you know that? So you want to be careful about being connected with anybody that is anti-Semitic. It's demonic. And I realize that it makes you uncomfortable when I'm dogmatic about that, but I, there are certain things you don't back up on. Certain things are preferences. I get that. Certain things are even prejudicial. I get that. But there are certain things that are doctrinal, absolute truth that will shake the foundation of everything you believe if you start letting them just get a little chip off here and a little chip off there. And then before long, you know what will happen? Your doctrinal position, the doctrine will still be here, but your position will be way out here like the church Brother Grokey told you about that says they're a Baptist church, but they don't believe anything that we believe. Right. We're not Baptists first. We're Bible believers first. Amen. And so that's the first thing. If it agrees with the Bible, then we'll, be, we'll, we'll line up with the Baptists. If the Baptists don't agree with the Bible, the Bible is the sole authority rightly divided, Amen. not the pastor, Amen. not the dictator. That's Hitlerism, Amen. sending out people to do things. That's the Catholic Church where the Pope is in charge of everything. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Amen. Amen. Good preaching. Amen. Would you like to have, we can go ahead and have an altar call now and just say, well, we all just recommitted our life to the right kind of things. That you have to do things decently and in order, ladies and gentlemen. You don't go into a restaurant and decide when you walk in the door, if it's a McDonald's, to order a hamburger that says Burger King on it. Right? right. right? Well, why would you come to a Baptist church like this and read the statement of faith out there and think that you're going to go order a chicken sandwich when all we have to offer is hamburgers? Right. We're not going to change the menu for you. Right. So well, now you shouldn't be that way. No, no. Wouldn't you be that way in your house? Yep. If somebody walked into your house, Brother Gentry, somebody walked into your house and said, now, I know y'all don't watch certain things, but I don't really see a problem on and clicked it on. Would that be all right with you? Well, I mean, come on. You know, you got to loosen up. Be a, little more, be a little more friendly and loving and kind. You wouldn't let them do that. Brother Larry, you own a business. Somebody comes in and tells you in your business you need to change this and change that. Be all right with you? All right. Now... Now, ladies and gentlemen, why would you give your ground up in your church? It's not what I believe. It's what the Bible teaches, and it's your church. They're infiltrating your house. So you have a right to say, we don't believe that here. I'd be glad to introduce you to the preacher. If you think you can persuade him, then okay. But no, I don't believe so. I, you know, Well, why? They can't persuade you, but they're going to start with you. The devil started with Eve. So you have to watch that. All right, now look at this thing in Psalms chapter number 40. Let's be encouraging today because everyone can enjoy encouragement. We all need encouragement every now and then, right? Right? And unfortunately, oftentimes, we strengthen the hands of those that do wrong and we give the wrong kind of encouragement. But I want to talk about the right kind of encouragement, Lord willing, and use a couple of passages if we can, please. Look, if you will, verse number one, you know the passage very well. I waited patiently for the Lord. That's a Bible believer's way of saying the Lord didn't answer me when I told him to. So and then when you write that to somebody else, you say, I waited patiently on the Lord. That's your way of saying I didn't have any choice but to wait. But now I'm going to make it look spiritual. This is David who wrote this Psalms. By the way, it's interesting. All the writers of the Bible are Jewish. Yes, sir. Amen. How can you be anti-Semitic? The one that died for you is Jewish. That's odd. That would mean the Holy Spirit would be Jewish. He's not, you know, gender neutral. He's connected with God the Father. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Just like, you know, not only did He hear my cry, but, oh yeah, and by the way, He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, and out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise of our God, unto, excuse me, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Meaning that when you start getting uh, right with the Lord, it has an impact on other people. The old crowd doesn't appreciate it. It makes them afraid. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Watch it. Verse 5. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. 
and thy thoughts which thou which or which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Brother Joshua Manning, you pray and ask the Lord to bless, would you please? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Leave your finger right there for just a second and turn to Nehemiah chapter number 4. I'm going to try to pair these two passages together and help you to think about this thought for just a minute. How quickly we forget. How quickly we forget. David is writing this psalm. Some people say it happens to be during the time that uh, he was being pursued by Saul. And other people say it's at a different time. It doesn't matter. It's apropos for the time in which we live. The bottom line is, is David is musing, thinking back, remembering, pondering on how good God has been. David is beginning to think about that. And as he goes through a process of crying and remembering where God brought him from, you see an upturn there in verse number five. And that upturn is, is that, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about how bad everything was, I realize how good God's been to me. But ask yourself this question. If it had not been for the bad, how would you realize how good God's been? In other words, the lower, the deeper you've been in the pit, the further he's pulled you out of, the more you tend to appreciate it. Here's the Lord. He's over in the New Testament there, and he goes to a Pharisee's house, probably an independent Baptist, and he's sitting down there to eat with him, and and everybody is there probably outside the paparazzi's around, and everybody in there bumping it out there on the social media for everybody to know Jesus is here, and Jesus is here, and they've got all the fixings and all the trimmings made up, and those kind of things are moving along real well, and an old prostitute walks in off the street, which is a horrible thing. I ask myself two questions every time I read this passage. How did the prostitute know where the Pharisee's house was? That's the first thing. That's just my my former employment coming out in me a little bit. And then secondly, when she touches the Lord, how is it that Pharisee knows so much about who she was and said if he knew who she was, he wouldn't let her touch him? You got to kind of read between the lines there. It's kind of like he knows a little bit too much about everybody else around there. And interestingly enough, about a woman of ill repute. But lest I digress, let me say this. They're sitting there and the Lord comes in and this Pharisee somewhat sees himself on an equal plane or equal uh, uh, bidding as far as the Lord is concerned. Because when the Lord comes in there, he doesn't treat him as if he is better than the Pharisee. He doesn't show him any special attention at all. And this woman comes in off the street and she begins to weep and to cry. You know the story as she's as she's there over the Lord and she begins to tears falling from her face onto the feet of Jesus Christ. And then she's wiping his feet with her hair, not only showing complete and total submission, but complete and total appreciation. And so immediately the Pharisee does, as we often do, begins to judge the book by the cover and says, you know, why are you touching somebody that's got cooties and those kind of things? And the Lord being really smart, very intellectual, being able to come in the side door or the back door, what he says is he says, hey, well, let me ask you a question. And, of course, I think the Pharisee kind of raised himself to his full height and said, I'm glad. You know, I've been to Bible school and everything. I was wondering when you were going to consult me on matters of great importance. What is it you'd like to know about government, politics? What would you like to know about science, education? Uh, What is it that you need some advice about? And the Lord said, well, you know, there's a fellow up here. I'll paraphrase somewhat. Please don't be too harsh with me. He says, there's a fellow over here and he owed this man five bucks. And there's another fellow that owed him 5,000 bucks. And the man that was owed the debt just said, ah, we'll just forgive the whole thing. He said, "Uh, while you're passing them taters over this way, here's the question. Here's the, the thing I'd like to know from you. Which one of those two do you think appreciated the forgiveness more? And, of course, the Pharisee's like, oh, well, that was easy, man. I didn't even have to go to Bible school to get that one. Now, I could have given you the theological dissertation on any number of things if you would have liked to hear it. And the Lord's like, no, let's just do the kiss theory here. Let's keep it simple, stupid. Because he doesn't realize what he is fixing to do is literally by this one simplified, stupid question, he is fixing to show the ignorance of this Pharisee who thinks he knows everything. And here's what he says to him. He said, well, the one who he forgave the greatest debt. And the Lord said, yeah, and that's why that people love other people more than they love other ones, because they appreciate more because they've been forgiven more. Pass the salt, please. 
What he just said to the Pharisee is, is the reason this woman appreciates me more than you do is because she knows I forgave her of more in her mind than I forgave you of. But the problem is not her. The problem is, is you think I forgave you less. But I forgave you of just as much as I forgave her of. You just think being a prostitute is worse than being a Pharisee. Later on in the passage when the Lord, and not, not that particular passage, and of course he just, he mentions some things to him there about, you know, him who loveth much and who has been forgiven much, loveth much and those kind of things. He's constantly sticking that guy, just sticking him, just constantly coming around that way. And then a little bit later on he's talking to some individuals and you know what he says? He says, hey, guess what? Prostitutes and misfits and outcasts, they'll go into the kingdom before the Pharisees and before all the rich people and all the other people that think there's somebody in society. Those individuals that nobody wanted anything to do with will be the ones that realize they have a need. Here's the illustration for you to see. Step number one, oftentimes we forget what God pulled us out of. Sometimes it's good for you to get down into the dregs of society to see where you could have been if it wasn't for the grace of God and His intervention. And I'd like to say this to you. Please be very, very careful about assuming you would be anything else uh, than what that person that you're looking down upon is if it wasn't for the intervention of the grace of God. Because I do know what the nomenclature for, the acronym for assuming is, and you're fixing to make a big donkey out of yourself if you think you would never be in that situation. If it had not been for where you were born, if it had not been for the Lord being merciful to you, if it had not been for everything across your way, across your path on a regular basis, literally no telling where you could be. I told a friend of mine the other day, we were sitting there in church on a Friday night, and we were sitting there, I said, this is pretty amazing, isn't it? And I, he said, yeah, it really is. And I said, no, I'm serious. He got, I said, this is amazing. We could be sitting in a jail cell. We could be in a dope house. We could have a needle run in our neck or in our arm somewhere. We could be sitting in the morgue somewhere. We could be any number of places. Do you realize why we're here? We're here because God's been good to us. Amen. You can't take credit for that. You can't you know, look at yourself and think that you're something. So what happens is, is David begins to think about, man, God has really been good to me. And he brought me up out of a horrible pit. He did save you from hell. Set my feet upon a rock. He did made sure you were there. And then he not only solidified your you're standing, but then he also changed your state where now you're singing the right songs and saying the right things and so on and so forth. If you don't understand that doctrinal principle of the difference in your standing and state, when you're saved, you're secure and safe until the day of redemption. It's like the Lord came down here, he bought you, he left you in the pawn shop and he said, I'll be back and get him later. But nobody can buy you anymore. Because you've been redeemed and you are now sealed until the day of what? So he'll come back and get you later on. Then you get a new body and all this other kind of stuff that goes with that. But what you have to realize is your standing is one thing. Your state fluctuates. That's the difference in sonship and fellowship. That's what a lot of people miss. That's where you get into losing salvation and all this other kind of stuff. Or I can't sin and I don't need 1 John 1, 9 and those kind of things that go along. You say, well, oh, that's just all this and that and the other and I just don't really know how to... No, you are still now that you're saved a sinner. And you can still mess up your fellowship, but you can never quit being a son. I'm going to get the knee of mine in just a second, but let me just kind of get the cream off the top here, if you don't mind, and I'm a little bit frothed up about it. So here comes the prodigal. The prodigal is in the, the, the Bible to show people, this is before Jesus died, but the prodigal is in the Bible to show people the main character there is God the Father, and in all honesty, the elder brother is the Pharisees, and that's done to stick the Pharisees. But we can get a practical illustration and application of that passage by applying Pauline doctrine to it. Paul, who was a Jew, who was talking to Gentiles about how to become the church. Did you just get that? You're not the church until you're saved. Then you become the church. You're a Gentile if you're not a Jew. Paul is a Jewish apostle who was called out to the Gentiles. He says that in about 14 places in the New Testament. And then he says, listen, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul's gospel is how that Christ died for your sins according to the Scripture, buried, raised again the third day according to the Scripture, right? I'm encouraging you. Now just get excited. And so here's the apostle Paul. He comes along and he says this. 
you can take anything written anywhere in that Bible as long as it doesn't contradict what God's given me to give to you. And if it contradicts what God gave me to give to you, it's not for you. Here's the example. Now look, ladies and gentlemen, I clearly understand that the majority of you know this, but it is imperative that you understand this because many people are saying what I'm about to say to you now is false doctrine or apostasy. But you cannot apply the Old Testament doctrine for when it comes to dietary laws to the New Testament. You don't apply the Levitical laws. You don't apply the things when it comes to certain things like, for instance, let's use the Sabbath. When you read Romans 13, you find the Sabbath is absent. Why? Because the Sabbath is for a sign to the Jews, the Sabbath is a Saturday. We don't worship God on, the, on a Sabbath. We worship on the first day of the week, which is a... Sunday. So when I'm telling you this is, is that now the Apostle Paul said that, listen, yes, Acts 2.38 was a plan of salvation for individuals that had to repent and be baptized. That's the gospel connected to the gospel of the kingdom. But you're saved by the repentance, by, by, by accepting Jesus Christ's death on Calvary's cross for you, accepting that he was buried and raised again the third day. Your gospel's not the same. Amen. There's no works added to it. Why? You don't find anywhere else in anywhere except Pauline epistles where Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 2. I know it feels a little like Sunday school, but, but bear with me. He says, listen, he said, you're saved by grace through what? And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of not of, not of, not of, lest any man should boast. But then I go to Revelation 12, I go to Revelation 14, I go to Hebrews chapter 6, I go to Matthew 24. These are they that had the faith in Jesus Christ and kept the commandments. <gasps> I haven't kept the commandments, I must be lost. No, I don't have to keep the commandments. I now am under the law of Christ. I now, because I'm saved and sealed, I don't have to add to my faith any works at all to be saved. So the blessing of that is, is I'm saved and free whether I ever hit a lick at a snake or not. And can I just say this while I'm on it so that it'll get upset with every, everybody get upset. Just because it's you're saved doesn't automatically mean you're immediately going to hit the harness and start serving. Amen. Well, I just believe if you're saved, you're going to quit smoking and cussing and drinking. Well, it depends on how long you've been smoking, cussing and drinking. Amen. You might not be able to give that up right away. Amen. Some of you have been saved 40 years and you still ain't quit cussing. Yeah, I, see, that was a silent amen. I did it for you because y'all are like, oh, whoa, didn't see that one coming. Where did that come from? Now, here's what you need to understand. Here's what you got to realize is, is that, listen, after you're saved, outside does not always indicate inside. The Bible says you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You don't all of a sudden conform to an image of a preacher or a Christian or an organization that says, well, if you're saved... You've got to do this and this and this and this. Here's what leads to individuals that are saying certain individuals can't be saved. Who died and left you God? Amen. He can save whoever he wants to save. Amen. And guess what? He can even save a homosexual Amen. if they will repent and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. Amen. Now, I know some of you probably half the crowd getting ready to go, OK, well, I'm out of here now. Really, because what you do is, is you take the scripture and you fit it to your own preferences or prejudices. I'm not for homosexuals, but let me just say this and let me make it very clear. I do not believe that they should be executed. That's not in the law of our land. That's an Old Testament thing. If God wants to do that, he can do that. But let me just say very clearly they have the ability to be saved like anybody else, an adulterer, a fornicator, a drug abuser, a thief, a robber, a rapist, a murderer, or anybody else. You cannot limit the grace of God to just people that you like. You can't just say, I just believe it's got to be like this because I don't like them. Hey, let me just tell you, you can't do that and limit God's grace. God has the ability to save who He wants. Now they have to be willing. Here's what you're going. Now, they got a reprobate mind. And so do you when it comes to that. You can't be persuaded against what you think and what the Bible says. Because you're... Listen, you want to stand in front of God and say, God, I just didn't believe you could save them. 
I think the first thing he will say to you in the person of Jesus Christ is this. I think he will turn to you and say, well, I saved you. I realize it's a wicked sin. I understand that. But when you start making that more wicked than you are and putting levels of things on it, it says a lot about what you think of yourself. You forgot the pit from whence you came. Now all of a sudden, the Bible doesn't become our, uh, our, our, our authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now it becomes our preferences, our prejudices, our choosing... To decide what we want it to say. I'm against that, but I'm also against fornication. I'm against that, and I'm also against gossip. I'm against slander. I'm against evil thinking. I'm against evil communications. I'm against anger and wrath and bitterness. There's a lot more in the Bible about that than just the other. I want to ask you this question, and then i got to move on, because we've only got about three more hours before the evening service. i got to ask you this question. Have you ever noticed certain people seem to always be fixated on that? Isn't it odd, isn't it strange that, uh, that, that they're just constantly fixated on the lifestyles of other people? I'm thinking to myself, well, there it is. That's a Pharisee's going, oh, look at her. Oh, look at her. Look at what she's doing. Look at how evil she is. Look at how wicked she is. Boy, God can't do nothing for her. Well, he certainly did. He touched what nobody else would touch. Can I say he ran to every leper instead of running away from him? And every devil possessed, devil possessed man, demon possessed man, he ran toward them. He didn't run away from them. The Lord was willing to touch what others would not touch. You got to be real careful about it. all of a sudden, well, they got cooties and they got this. The Lord is harder on people that have doctrinal wrongs than he is physical fleshly wrongs. I would simply call into question anybody that fixates always on what somebody else is doing. A fellow said to me a couple of months ago, and I guess it must have gotten out by now. It was before Christmas. I was at a meeting and he says, well, I ain't heard you preach no good and on queers lately. I said, well, why? Did you need that or something? <laughs> Come on, man, he said like that. And I said... Well, brother, to be honest with you, I don't have any in my congregation that I know of. My job is not to take a public worldwide stage. My job is to pastor my folks, and I don't need to be practicing or preaching to them about all of those kind of things. You say, why? It doesn't exist. We can mention it every now and then, but too much of it causes us to ignore our own sin. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right, preacher. That's good, preacher. Yes, sir. Why ain't you doing it? I don't know. I know it gets broadcasted, but that's not where I'm talking. I'm talking to us in here. And if they get in, then okay. But if not, it's not like, you know, well, I'm here to straighten out the sins of the world. You know, I'll mention some of these other guys that are out there doing some things every now and then, but it doesn't really affect y'all. So what's the point of hammering it all the time? And it's real easy because they're like so stinking easy to target. I mean, like you hit it, it's like having a sawed-off shotgun and you can just, they're just like shooting stinking pigs in a barrel. You say, that's fish. No, the fish are harder to hit because they can move. Pigs don't move very much in a barrel. Y'all are thinking pigs in a blanket because you're saying it's lunchtime. We ain't even close yet. Look at this thing. Now, listen, I, I, listen, this is important stuff for you to grab. Because the Bible says to you in the last days that there are some individuals that come in privily, they quietly, privately, they slip in from among you and they're trying to constantly fish you out of the pond where the Lord wants you to be by some odd, some strange, some some weird, unusual thing that's way out there on the fringes. Let me tell you where the Lord operates. The Lord operates right here, right in the middle, right there. He doesn't operate way over here. Y'all are in the hump here. And way over here, y'all are in it also. He operates in the middle right here. He doesn't operate way out there on the You say, why? A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. What does He want? He wants you to be in the middle. Not on a razor blade. Not, oh, oh, which way do, no, no, there's plenty of room to move. You've got to kind of find your, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. 
Not in the way that you might think where there's, where there's this strict, tight, almost bondage feeling thing. Bondage always creates bitterness, even if it's the bondage of religion. Here's, here's the Lord. Listen now. Here's the Lord. He's common sense down to earth. Did you ever look at the people that he was with and that were around him? There, there wasn't in that bunch. Now look, he had a doctor with him. He was buried by a fellow, Nicodemus, that had plenty of money. I mean, there was a lot of individuals around him. But, but did you ever notice how common he was? When he would talk to people, though he had the ability to be very, very philosophical and know all these things, he knew every language that ever was because he's the one that made him back in the Tower of Babel. He went down and confused their language. He knows how to speak every language. But instead of wowing them with his linguistics, what he would say is, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. You want to follow Me? You're not going to have a permanent residence. You're not going to have everything everybody else has here. Why? We're looking for things there. Very common. Very ordinary. What does He say? Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Cast out the demons. Why? Meet their physical needs, but give them something spiritual. Down to earth, practical teaching and preaching that you can put to work tomorrow when you go to work on Monday morning. All the other stuff is just religious hierarchy, slinging smoke and, and calling on devils and doing different things like that. I mean, it might make you feel so religious, but you ain't going to have much of a relationship like that. Listen, your marriage will not survive on just, hey, baby, I love you. And she's like, if you do, get off your blessed assurance and get a job. That's why that's one of the books that's in the Bible. It means get one. It's right in the heart of the Bible. That's what it is, right? Job, isn't that in there? Yeah, it means get one. You say, why? If you don't work, you don't eat. You want to get married, get a job. Be responsible. Amen. Brother, Co- Brother Coker woke up over there. He's like, I like that. Get a job. He's been working since forever. Now, now here's what I want you to understand. Whenever anything doesn't make down-home country sense, when you start getting into all of this militant stuff and that kind of a deal, you're outside the Bible. You're going to take the Bible and you're going to twist it, turn it, fix it, because at heart, you're a rebel. At heart, you're a maverick. At heart, you don't want anybody to tell you what to do. So, because Hitler was a pipsqueak, what he did was, is he chose to rule people by being brutal with them and bullying them into doing it. And now we have preachers that are bullying people with the Scripture. And getting you to be opposed to things that the Bible's like, why aren't you even worried about that? Like you think we're going to be here? God, guns, and guts. What? Where's that? Amen. Hey, can I say something? You, uh, can, can, I, can I suggest something to you? Where we just were in Moldova, I double dog dare you to preach that foolishness over there like you think everybody ought to preach it over here. The KGB will lock you down so fast it'll make your head swim and there won't be no CLA for you to call. Amen. You drag people into your foolishness and you don't care about the collateral damage. You're not a pastor. You're a wolf. What you're trying to do is destroy people for your own reputation. You're like a David Koresh. You're going to have some kind of weird, odd, strange, you know something nobody else does, and you build your ministry on the backs of innocent, uninformed, unintellectual people. Wicked as hell itself. But now it's kind of accepted because it appeals to our rebellious nature. Rebellion in the Bible is as the sin of witchcraft. I'm coming to Nehemiah in a little while. But you need to understand the church was never put here to be against an organization. It was here to be for Jesus and to prepare people for eternity. It's not here to prepare you for the tribulation. It is here to prepare you to get out of the tribulation. 
go to these things that I hear these people talking about and all that kind of a deal. You know, it's amazing because in other countries, they would have taken them out and they would have disappeared into some black hole of nothingness. But over here, because you have certain unalienable rights by the United States Constitution that you hold higher than the Bible, you're allowed to say things that are inflammatory and cause innocent people to be hurt. In my days, that was inciting a riot. But now we've gotten warm and fuzzy and it's kind of like, well, you know, you got to kind of... Here's the danger. If the Bible is right, that is an individual that cares not about sparing the flock at all and just lets the flock get tore to shreds. For what? An earthly cause? You're not supposed to be living for an earthly cause. If all you have in life is your finances and your house and whatever new weapon you happen to have bought or whatever, you ain't got much. I want to see where's Jesus. If Jesus is there, put your sword up, Peter. And grab a towel if you got the backbone for it. But it might be a little heavy. You might need a little help with it. It takes a man to pick up a towel. You don't even have to be a punk to pick up a sword. Anybody can swing a sword. But you've got to be a man to pick up a towel. Give us some Bible, okay? Don't choke on it now. You're going to feel like a snake's running down your throat. Jesus Christ laid aside His garment, girded Himself with a towel, and got a wash basin and got on His hands and knees and washed their feet. Jesus Christ had the ability to speak and have people vaporized, and He got down there and washed the feet. You say... So that's your uh, precedent. That's my precedent. Jesus Christ was man enough to pick up a sword, and then I mean to pick up a towel, and then after that, man enough to pick up a cross. Something some of you know nothing about. You're fighting too hard to stay alive, to preserve your stinking rights that you only have because you happen to be born here. You didn't do anything to get them. You just happened to be born here and on your passport or your birth certificate it says USA. You can pay the price to get that. How dare you? How offensive of you to act like you paid the price for anything? Somebody else gave you those rights and you sure are abusing them. They weren't given to you to misuse. Never were intended to be that way. You just heard Brother Grokey get up here. I'm pulling you in, brother. Sorry. Hope it doesn't offend you. He said that just now after 500 years or however many years it was, they just separated the church from the state. That's a big deal. You claim to separate church and state. You don't want the government in your business, but you're all in the government's business. That's right. Yes, sir. Come on, preacher. Yes, sir. That's an amazing thing to me. Well, if it's fair for the goose, it's fair for the gander. I hope they come down on you with both feet. I'm not a 5013C corporation. I don't get no license from the government to preach the gospel. Bless God, I'm not going to... Oh, come on, relax. What's the problem, man? Chill out. I'm not impressed with all that at all. Now that you've said all that, what have you said? People that give to your organization don't get a tax write-off? Big deal. We have people throw cash in the plate around here. We have people that don't even go here that give money to this place. We don't do it because we get a tax write-off, big tax write-off. We do it because it pleases Him. But you use it as a talking point. You use it to show all the churches that aren't just like you are not the right churches. How come you're so interested in always fighting churches? Why don't you spend more time fighting the devil? I don't understand that. I don't want you fighting churches. I don't want you going into the Catholic Church and blowing out their candles. That's right. I, I hope you got enough common sense. Really? Look at all them candles. <sighs> you know? That's how they believe. They got a right to believe that. 
I hope you've got enough sense that if you have to go to a Catholic funeral because it's a friend of yours that died that was Catholic, I hope that because you're going there to try to console and maybe look for an opportunity to get the gospel out, that you have enough sense to not go, I ain't going down there and taking that cookie, that death cookie, that thing with the skull and crossbones on it, him holding it up there and worshiping that thing. I'm not going to... I Look, I know the doctrine behind the thing, but I hope you got enough cooth and I hope you're solid enough in your faith not to worry about your reputation and you have to make fun of everybody else's because... You're worried about your weak faith, I guess. What do they say if you go there? Jesus talking to a prostitute. Nobody suspected Jesus of trying to, uh, to, uh, to get some favors. Why would you even be worried about what they were thinking? You go to so-and-so to preach? Or what does that matter to you? Maybe it's an open door. Maybe that's where the Lord wants me to go. I wouldn't go there. I'm not sure they're going to ask you. <laughs> But now all of a sudden we get into this thing of now I'll tell you where I think you should go, although I would not ever go or may not ever be asked, but I'm going to uh 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 be careful now. They're not gun toting, constitution bearing, getting ready for the tribulation church. They must be unsaved. Oh, now we're gonna get spiritual. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna determine somebody's saved or lost status based on whether or not they line up with us on the outside. You have no right to upset a peaceful place with your damnable doctrinal heresy. Nehemiah chapter 4, shall we continue? Verse number 10, the Bible says, And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed. And there is much rubbish. Watch what happens. So we're not able to build the wall. We're trying to get something built, right? Trying to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Trying to get something done, right? Amen. All right? Now, we've reestablished that we forgot things pretty quickly. We got things, we let things slip. So now we realize we're kind of back on equal foot and boy, the Lord has been good. Couch your many blessings, name them one by one and it'll surprise you what the Lord has done. Now Nehemiah has gone to the king. The king has given him an edict and says, hey, go build the wall. That's fine. And he's going to supply everything. And so now he's got the people around him and now they're beginning to get ready to build and things. And they walk up there and there's a conspiracy by Tobiah going on behind the scenes there. But I'll get to that in a second. The strength of the, of the bearers of the burdens is decayed because they're there's much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. Our adversaries said they shall not know neither see till we come. Look at that. Verse number 11. In the midst among them and slay them. What is their purpose? What was the purpose of the adversary? It's in the passage. There is no other reason you're here. You're trying to cause the work here to cease. These adversaries weren't ever a part of them. They did not show up until Nehemiah showed up over there and was trying to get something done. And then they began to go, whoa. Nehemiah's got a good thing going there. You know what we should do? We should use his credibility. We should use his stability. We should use what he's got in connection to the king that's providing things for him. I mean, look at that man. He's got bulldozers and front-end loaders. He's got four-by-fours. He's got all the building equipment he needs. He's got the manpower. You know what? In order for us to attach credibility to our ministry, we need to be involved with them. But... We need to take everything that the king is giving to them and their manpower and we need to stop what it is they have been called to do in order for us to facilitate what we want to do. Amen. They didn't show up until the work started. They didn't get their hands dirty. They weren't involved in laying the first foundational stones, nor were they involved in removing the rubbish to rebuild the wall on the second wall that's going to be built. They're just simply out here going, you know what? We should kind of maybe consider if you can't beat them, join them. At least make it look that way until we get our claws in there real firm. 
until we get their kids away, like we talked about in Sodom. Go ahead and take my daughters. I don't care what you do to them. Just that kind of a thing. Until I get my calls, until I get emotional attachments, until I get individuals that are behind me, until I get a following, and then we'll eventually tell us who you are. That's why I appreciate what Brother Grokey had to say today. He said, hey, you know, we're over there and they're King James only and that kind of a thing, which is an odd thing over in that country, if you know much about that country at all, as he told you. And yeah, we've been reading after Dr. Gibb, we've been reading after Dr. Ripplinger. Yeah, that's really something else. And then he just says, do you know a guy named Dr. Ruckman? Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, man, we've been to that church. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, so I don't have to come over here and put on a Halloween mask and act like something I'm not? Yeah. So people say to me on a regular basis, why do you have to always talk about he's dead because he was my friend, Amen. but also because he stands for certain things doctrinally and it helps to kind of help people to understand it really tests the metal of individuals where people will say because he was dispensational. I'm not dispensational because Dr. Ruckman was dispensational. I'm dispensational because I studied it out and because I went to school and because I learned about it. And guess what? The Holy Spirit said, that's it. And the Bible just started making sense to me. Yes, I'm not a hyper dispensationalist, but let me say this to you. If you're not dispensational, we are dispensational. Amen. Not just in salvation plans, but in almost everything. You have to rightly divide the Bible or you're an idiot, in our opinion. There's certain things he stands for that people are like, oh, well, I just don't believe God can use somebody that's been married before. Okay, well, did a pretty good job with him. I guess he got up there to heaven and said, the Lord said, you know, I didn't count any of that stuff you did for me at all because, you know, I realized you'd been married before. The brethren have been calling me real regular about you. We've been waiting for you to get here just so I could tell you you've been wasting your time. You know what he would say? Well, okay, it would beat the fire out of the life I came from. At least I tried to do something with it. You know what? I don't think his motive was to try to get something. I think it was just to sure beat the fire out of where I was before. You say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want anybody. I would just, just literally just recently had somebody say, well, because of you, then what about his beliefs? About what? Ask me. I'll tell you anything. I'm an open book. But I'm not going to act like I don't know him just so I can get you in here. And if you're afraid because of being 23 years, he came here 23 years every year, 20 of those years in prisons, two weeks out of every year for 20 years. He's my friend. He was my mentor. He's my teacher in a lot of ways. You know what? I, I'm, see, I'm not like y'all. I don't like change my friends like I change my socks whenever it happens to change the color of my suit. I don't do that. If people don't like him, that's okay. He's the one that told me you don't have to fight the flag unless you're going into battle. He said, if you can go help them, that's fine. But there's something about me that when I'm sitting around the table and Alligator Arms is sitting over there and sooner or later... He's just got to make a comment. And, and, and there's just something about me, and I, and I know it's not necessary, that wants to say, can you explain to me why you think it's necessary during this meeting to even bring that conversation up? What, what is it of all we're talking about right now caused you to do that right there? Why, what's your motive? I want to know. I ain't here to cause no trouble. Hey, take it down a notch or two, man. I'm not standing up. Why did you say that if it was not to try to influence what's going on here with these younger preachers? And there's just something inside me that wants to say, and I just did this. Did you ever talk to him? No. Did you ever call him on the phone? No. You wrote him a letter? I know you didn't write him an email. He didn't have it. Did you, did you ever write him a letter? He would have written back. No. Well, then can I ask you a question? And I'm going to ask the guys here at the table. I've done all of those things, and I do know a little bit about him. Not as much as Brother Donovan and some of his students, maybe, but I know a little bit about him. Who are you going to believe? Somebody that has just been hearing other people, and it's been jaded by his own personal opinion? Or you want to listen to somebody that really knew him? So, sometimes people come here and the first question they want to know. 
Do you know Dr. Ruckman? Yep. Amen. Don't go. Yeah, but now he's dead now, and, 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 and our preacher didn't actually go to school there. I mean, he was here, but I mean, don't be... I mean, and listen, we just want you to know, I don't believe everything he believed. Why do you, why do you have to put the distance there? What's the problem? Do you know him? Yeah. He's a blessing to us. He helped us. Sorry he don't help you. Don't know what to tell you. Go keep your commentaries hidden under your bed where nobody can see it. <laughs> I want to try to help you. I want to try to encourage you. But the encouragement is not how you might think. The encouragement is to lift you up, to exhort you, to make you feel good because you've been in times of trouble. I kind of set you up a little bit in Psalms chapter 40. What I want to do is encourage you that it's always right to stand up for what's right. Amen. And Amen. you don't need to feel ultra grace or ultra guilty about saying whether it is across a dinner table or in your church vestibule. We don't believe that here. What we believe is written there. And if you have questions about it, our pastor's door is always open. You can talk to the deacons. You can talk to the trustees. If you talk to anybody you want to talk to, but this is what we believe. Well, we just think, okay, no problem. They think that down there. They think that over there. They think that over there. They think it 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 over there. Think it down there, wherever. But we don't believe that. Amen. I want to encourage you because it bothers some of you. Because what happens? Got a parking lot now. Got a building now. Now the wall is starting to be built. And look who shows up. Amen. The adversaries. Why? Well, before when we had a trailer behind this thing and Porta Johnny's, people are like, yeah, we really want that. And a preacher that would preach two hours if he preached a minute. And I mean, preached from like, started here and went to a scream and stayed at a scream. There was no modulation of anything. I don't know how many microphones we blew up back in the day. Busted walls, busted pews, busted all kind of craziness and that kind of a deal. But we had like a pine ticket out here. We were up to our eyeballs in debt. And we had a little what looked like a Pentecostal snake handling back here. Some of you even got, do y'all handle snakes over there? Yeah, you should come here and we keep them in a box out back. If you come, you can hear them back there zzz, and buzzing at you. But it's got to really get good before the preacher will get the snakes. You know, back in the day where you go to the Porta Johnny back there, it's 90 degrees outside, and I'm like, guys, i got to go. i got to get up here to preach. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. And I walk in the door, and I get in there, and all of a sudden, y'all are like, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> <laughs> or what's worse is, is you start rocking the thing back and forth and all that kind of deal like that. You know, oh, just cutting up, kidding. We didn't have anything. We didn't have a bunch of Fruit Loops showing up then. But now, something's starting to grab traction. And you're seeing some people get saved. And you're seeing the jail ministry going. And the mission fields going. And some of you are catching on fire. And you're going to the mission field yourself. And you're in Bible school. And you're coming to church more than just on Sunday morning. And it's grabbing traction. And there's, a, there's like a, an excitement in the air. And then we get a parking lot that actually has asphalt on it. That's what a parking lot's supposed to have. And it's got stripes and curbings and somewhere for the water to go. How many years did we have, you know, Lake Hartley out here? Right? Oh, no, don't be wearing those shoes, sister. Why not? Because if it rains, you're going to need some wading boots. You're going to ruin them shoes. If the gravel don't get you, the mud will. Right? How many times you ladies taking off those and trying to get out there like on your tiptoes and you're up to your knees, you know, you're waiting out there and trying to get in the parking lot. And now you got a paved parking lot and a drainage ditch. I'm back there. I like to watch Dale cut the drainage ditch. I'm like, thank God for the drainage ditch. Because before it never drained, it just sat until it dissipated over time. Remember, we'd have a frog strangler during the church service and everybody's out here going, I wonder if my car's floating away. And now, it's not you. God has used you to do something here. And Nehemiah's calling is on you. And you've seen the king say to you, go do something. Before I come, go get something done. 
Here's the good thing. You've got to be doing right or there wouldn't be adversaries. Amen. And guess what? They come in. They had no intention whatsoever of helping you do what God called you to do. They are there to connect themselves so they can use your credibility in the community to make it look like they're on the same page. I'm almost to a close. I'm encouraging you. Don't be afraid. Listen, don't, don't let your niceness and your graciousness, when they overstep that grace boundary and you get to that doctrinal issue, don't be afraid to go, hey, whoa, wait. Uh-uh. I don't, I don't want you to think my silence is condoning what you believe. I don't believe that. If you want to believe that, I believe in your right to do that. But I just want you to know, don't attach me to you because I didn't say anything. And now things are starting to break loose. Now, well, aren't you Baptist? Yes, but why would you ask me that? Well, we're Baptist. <laughs> Not all Baptists are the same. And I don't just mean Southern and Independent. I mean, some people are Independent Baptists. How many weeks did I spend on Calvinism? You say, why? Because that's what a lot of Baptists preach. I don't know what happened. I preached on grace for like, six or seven sermons. And of course, you all only heard the last couple where we were turning some ground up a little bit. But you know, say why? Because some people preach no grace at all. It's just constant, just, just constant driving and spewing. I remember those days. But now you're trying to get something done. It is a testimony to your character and it is a testimony to what you've accomplished because you're now attracting the attention of your adversary. And you have to get accustomed to that. Well, I don't have time. I guess it's getting close to 12 o'clock. I heard somebody's stomach rumble or somebody throwing up one. I don't know what it was. but They kind of sound the same, if you know. But at any rate, one's a little louder than the other one. But what Nehemiah does ultimately is he says, okay, the adversaries coming in have discouraged the workers. It didn't discourage Nehemiah, but it discouraged the workers. It'll discourage you. Be aware of that. It's like, man, everything was going so good. Why, why do they have to come in with hat pin theology and bust our bubble? Why, why do they got to do it? Here's what will happen. It'll happen with your kids. It'll happen with your wives. It'll happen with people you've ministered to and discipled. And you got them in church and you're excited and that kind of a thing. And the next thing you know, you start seeing them graduate and gravitate. And the next thing you know, they get pulled right out of your midst. You're like, ah, that's discouraging. So what does Nehemiah do? You can read the pages later on. And the guys do this stuff in school. So those of you that are in school, you already know where this is going. Nehemiah doesn't respond and doesn't go in and make a confrontation at this moment. He just tells them, let's clear off the rubbish first. Quit letting them use all the mistakes and all the stuff of your past and let's go ahead and start doing it brick by brick. But now that we know there's adversaries, have a sword in one hand and a trial in the other. Amen. You say, what does that mean, preacher? You just said don't pick up the sword. Well, here's the thing. You never stop your working. The sword is not for an army coming at you. It's for the adversaries among you. You never put your Bible down just for the work. That is to fend off people that don't believe the Bible the way you believe the Bible. Amen. It won't be a Catholic. That's it. That's right. it will not be a Church of Christ. I can promise you it will not be a charismatic. It won't be a Lutheran. It will be a Baptist. Amen. And under the cloak of Baptist... We're just alike. Better back off. Somebody think it hurt. I don't want to be associated with you. Do you hear me? I don't want to be associated with you. I don't want anybody in this community that we've been in for 30 years to think we are affiliated or associated with certain Baptists who do not believe like we believe. Amen. 
all the things I gave to you at the beginning. You say, why? We spent 30 years developing a reputation for what we are and what we believe, and we catch enough heat without getting your foolishness attached to it. Amen. 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 That's good. Amen. Amen. Why are you saying it publicly? Same reason Nehemiah did to tell the people. Amen. You say, why? It doesn't do any good to keep covert. You say, why? Because without witnesses, Tobiah goes out and starts writing letters. Gets on the Internet. It's on the YouTube. Starts a smear campaign. Sure, sure. Then Tobiah goes out and gets Sam Ballot, gets him some other people, and they're gonna now gonna work the other people around to figure out how we can stop this thing. Big deal to try to get it going. Why? Because Nehemiah's doing what the king told him to do. But the first line of defense is you, I hate to tell you. You have to say, mm mm. I'm not stopping what God called me to do. And you don't get to interrupt it. Amen. Amen. It means too much to me. Amen. God's done a lot for all of us Amen. because of this place, Amen. because of that book, because of the right people we are affiliated with that have filled this pulpit and preached and helped us. God's done something here in spite of human instrumentality. But now you know what the Lord says? Now that you got something, you got to protect it. You say, why? You're going to draw attention from the adversary. I want to encourage you. It's a good thing. It means you're doing right. Number two, don't get defeated, don't get discouraged, don't get downtrodden when everybody who claims to be one thing and isn't tries to get you. You know what you say? Hey, we ain't stopping the work. Guess what happened? Here's the good thing at the end of the story. They get the wall built. Tobiah is relentless. Even though the wall is built and commerce has returned, everything's going great. He then, after Nehemiah is gone, just like Paul said, grievous wolves come in from among him, not sparing the flock. He comes back in and he starts working a deal and it starts off with doing trade deals instead of kicking them out of the city on the Sabbath. They kind of let them stay. They were supposed to be outside the gate and he lets them in the gate. And then before long, they've moved inside the gate. And next thing you know, guess what happens? Tobiah has set up in the temple. And the place where God's stuff is supposed to be, all that's been moved out to make room for Tobiah. And the people are like, well, he seems like a nice guy. And he's a political mover and shaker. He's involved in politics. And he knows all the right people, pushes all the right buttons. You know who he voted for. You know what party he's from. So it's beneficial, advantageous of all the places he could go. We have him in our temple. Well, until Nehemiah showed back up. Nehemiah says this, watch. What happened to the singers? Man, y'all were about, the the roof was kind of like doing this this morning. Y'all were singing. You sing because you're happy. You sing because you're joy-filled. You know what you can tell a lot about a church by how it sings? They're singing like that. Well, what happened is, is the first thing that goes to the singing. You know what David said when he lost the joy of of the Lord's salvation? You know what he said? And when I get things right, then will I sing again. He says this. What happened to the singers? Oh, well, we didn't really need that anymore. We've replaced it. We got all kind of electric stuff now. We got contemporary canned stuff. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about a choir. We don't need all these people. It is an expense. It's a huge deal to have all them people. He says, okay, well, who's taking care of all the artifacts and everything in the temple? We don't really need them anymore because we don't use them for worship anymore. We're updated. We're upgraded. We got a plexiglass pulpit and we're just in a golf chart and a pair of shorts or cargoes or whatever. And, you know, hey, we're all good. Jeans and a T-shirt, man. Strapped, ready to go. Nehemiah's like, wow. And where's that in the book? It ain't. Amen. Any more than the stuff Koresh or Jim Jones had was in a book. It was the book twisted, demonically inspired to use the church for something other than what it was intended to do to dirty up God's virgin. Nehemiah said, well, what about back there 
where the priest is. Surely you hadn't gotten rid of that. I mean, I mean, really, you, surely you still got the priest. I mean, he may be compromised and he may be carnal, but surely, right? Um, he's walking down the hall. He said, where's the priest's name tag there? Well, Tobiah? You let Tobiah in here? That's not the Tobiah when we were building the wall Tobiah, right? That's, that can't be the same guy. Uh, well, uh, preacher, uh, well, uh, he's just a pretty persuasive guy. Nehemiah probably said something like, I'll be jumped. <laughs> now, now, Nehemiah, just, just hold on now. You, uh, 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 I'm going to go in and I'm going to grab him by the stinking ears and I'm ousting him and everything in there. You put God's stuff back where it belongs and you're going to restore the worship the way God intended it to be and you kick that stinking wolf out. Amen. Amen. Right. That's good. And then Nehemiah preaches a great sermon. He's grabbing people by the hair. Pow! Now, I wouldn't recommend that. But that's because Nehemiah had respect for holy things. Amen. And I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about that book you claim to believe. Genesis chapter number 3, the devil started by perverting words. And that's what they're doing, is twisting and perverting words. And you ought to say, thank you, no thank you. You say what? When they realize they don't have a following, they'll muster up some people and they'll try to cause trouble and they'll run out a whole bunch of things and do a smear campaign and all that. That's what cheap politicians always do. And then after they find out that the work's going on, they'll find somebody else to go infiltrate and they'll start all over again. I want to encourage you. It's not wrong to stand up for what's right. Ma'am, if they come to you You say, can you wait right here? I'm not going to have this conversation with you, but I have a husband. I know you're biblically equipped. I understand that. But there's a reason he came to you. Because he's a bully. If your husband isn't here, with Miss Robin's permission... You can use TK, not as your husband. (laughs) But you can use TK to say, hold on, I'll get him here, and then he can hold you until the preacher gets here or the deacons get here or somebody else gets here. You say, why? We don't take too kindly to people coming into our house that we've prayed over and we've bled over and we've sweated over. And try to change things into what they want it to be instead of what God wants it to be for us. We don't, we don't appreciate it at all. We don't think it's funny. We don't think it's humorous. We think it's downright offensive. So, well, not everybody believes that. They believe that. They may not always agree with me, but when it comes to that, whether they're in or out, we are unified on that. You might be surprised. You think, I'll go pick on a little fellow over here. He might... You might wish you had picked on somebody else. He'll climb up you like a cat without climbing gear. You'll be sure enough scratched. Let me encourage you. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Last but not least, y'all give me the privilege of traveling and what I am beginning to see is a slipping in of Tobiah. A slipping in. 